Welcome to the fifth installment of Black Cat Theology. My name is Dr. Peter Dillard, and we are continuing our investigation of possible relationships between the later philosopher Martin Heidegger and contemporary theology. Last time we began considering how more phenomenological content or definite experiential content might be injected, if you will, into the most promising of the three proto-theologies that we extracted from Heidegger's later writings. Now to refresh our memories, recall that Heidegger tells a certain kind of story or he presents a certain kind of narrative, most notably in the contributions to philosophy. Now the first part of this narrative is that we might undergo a transformation whereby we stop thinking about being metaphysically as the most general characteristic common to all and only beings, and we start thinking about being and the world in a radically non-metaphysical manner. Heidegger calls this the event of Adreignis, or the first advent, we might designate it. Now, once that takes place, a second advent becomes possible. It doesn't mean that it will definitely happen, but it's only possible for it to happen once the first advent, the event of Ragnus, has taken place. And that second advent is the manifestation of the holy per se, or as Heidegger describes it, the passing by of the last god. Now notice already that this narrative fits much better with the third proto-theology that we identified, according to which the holy is neither the same as non-metaphysical being, nor is the holy the same as any particular being, Rather, the holy is a special kind of non-being that, unlike fictitious non-beings such as Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny, plays a very special role in that it might come to shelter the non-metaphysical event of being or divinize it, as Heidegger says. And certainly, Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny don't divinize anything. They don't shelter anything. Now, where does the phenomenology come into this, all of this, and how does that give us the theological options that we were describing last time. Well, remember that Heidegger discusses two very different kinds of experiences in his later writings. Sometimes he speaks about what he calls the struggle between world and earth, or the strife between world and earth. And this is the struggle to wrest some measure of unconcealment or disclosure from what is concealed or hidden. The other kind of experience that Heidegger describes sometimes is very different. It's a kind of energized tranquility or serenity or gelassenheit in German, letting be. And Heidegger has this in mind when he talks about the fourfold dwelling of the earth, sky, divinities, and mortals. It's a much more tranquil, serene kind of experience. And these are experiences that we can relate to as human beings. Now how does that lead to different possible theological options? Well, go back to the narrative for a minute. It depends on how we assign the phenomenologies to the parts of the narrative. If, if, depending on how we assign each phenomenology to a particular part of the narrative, we come up with a particular theological option. So, for example, if we assign or relate the experience of strife, struggle, to the attempt to become transformed out of problematic metaphysical ways of thinking to non-metaphysical thinking, while we assign the experience of Galassenheit or the tranquilized tranquility to the manifestation of, whole, of the holy, that yields what I called a Galassenheit theology. Alternatively, if we associate the experience of Galassenheit with the process of undergoing this transformation from non -metaph from metaphysical to non-metaphysical ways of thinking, while we associate the experience of strife with our encounter with divinity, that yields a theology of strife, a strife theology. Now last time I said what I wanted to work toward was a kind of ledger where we compare the strengths and weaknesses of each theological option with an eye to making a provisional decision about which one we want to try to develop in the remainder of these lectures. Now I got a little bit ahead of myself because I think we need to have a better understanding of how these theologies might work and in particular, what, how might they relate to certain aspects of sacred scripture? So what I want to do today are two things. First of all, I want to say a little bit more about the methodology that's informing my reflections on these topics. And secondly, I want to show how both Strife theology and Galassenheit theology can be used as lenses through which to interpret 
key scriptural episodes, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Today I'm only going to talk about the Old Testament example. Next time we'll look at the New Testament one. So let's begin with the methodological point. Heidegger is very hostile to metaphysics, and we might ask ourselves, should we be? Should we, is, is metaphysics always a bad thing when we, we are doing theology? Now, some, some people would say yes. We can certainly think of uh, theologians in the history of theology like Martin Luther who think that theology uh, doesn't have anything to do with, or shouldn't have anything to do with metaphysics, and that the problem is that metaphysics runs the risk of setting up a counterfeit deity and distracting our attention from the theology of the cross, according to Martin Luther. But we, we also might take a more um, moderate position here and say, well, look, maybe it's not the problem that, it's not the case that metaphysics always is a problem. Maybe there are instances where a certain metaphysical picture or a certain metaphysical notion or idea can actually help to advance theological inquiry. And here by metaphysics I mean broadly not just an understanding of being as a maximum general characteristic common to all and only beings, or a transcendental notion if you will, but also typical metaphysical notions and distinctions like we could talk about the distinction between a substance and its accidents, or we could talk about the notions of actuality uh, and potentiality, or we could talk about matter and form, or we could talk about necessity and contingency or possibility. Those are notions that are familiar to people who have studied the metaphysical tradition. And I think, let me just say here, that let, let's not assume at the outset that it's always a bad idea to engage in metaphysical thinking when, some, when one is engaged with theological questions. It may be that for some people, a, a certain theological notion could be helpful. I myself, in other work that I have done, have discussed theological problems that arise within particular metaphysical frameworks and that can be resolved, or at least we can make some measure of progress in removing confusion by drawing upon the resources of that very metaphysical framework. So that's a very personal thing. It comes down to who is the person who is having whatever the theological problem is, where is that person coming from, and what does the person need in order to make progress in unraveling or at least easing some kind of puzzlement or uncertainty that he or she may have. And so I want to say that let's consider that on a case-by-case -case basis. The only thing that I am saying is, and we've already seen examples of this, sometimes the metaphysical baggage is more of a problem than it's worth because the problems that are confronting the person or the theologian are being generated by the very metaphysical notions themselves. And so that we need to come up with some non-metaphysical way of understanding them so that whatever the, the, the puzzlement or the obscurity is no longer arises. I gave an example or two of that last time. Uh, I also give some examples at the beginning of chapter 4 of my book where metaphysical or more broadly philosophical notions might actually be helpful. So if you're interested in that, you can certainly look at that part of the text. So basically what I'm saying is I, I'm embracing here a kind of soft pragmatism. I mean that in distinction to a kind of hard pragmatism, and here I have in mind people like Richard Rorty who think that metaphysics or metaphysical vocabulary is something that we need to set aside, that it's really not worth the trouble. We, we need to try to think beyond it en masse, in toto. We need to get rid of it. Whereas I'm saying, well, let's look on it, let's look at this matter on a case-by-case -case basis and in connection with particular individuals, and let's see whether in this particular instance we need to, we might find it useful to use metaphysical notions, or maybe not. So it's a kind of soft pragmatism. Now, let's turn then to the two different theologies and the way they might be applied to certain key episodes in sacred scripture. What I want to do today is look at one from the Old Testament. This is the very famous story about the golden calf. We all remember that story. We remember that when Moses went up to Mount Sinai to, to communicate with God, the Israelites, led by Aaron, were missing not only him, but also their relationship to God through him. And so they persuaded Aaron to, to have a golden calf 
smelted for them, and they began to worship it in idolatry. And so when Moses came back, he was very angry. He destroyed the golden calf. He chastised the people. And so this was a very important turning point or incident in the history of the Israelite people in the Old Testament. Now, notice that when we go back to this episode, there's a way in which we can understand the Israelites who've been left behind by Moses while he's in communion with God. We can understand them as, in a way, nevertheless trying to maintain or preserve their relationship with divinity. What they want is an image or a representation of the divine that makes the divine intimate to them, makes it intimately present to them. And so their motives on one level in uh, raising the golden calf, we can understand that as a heartfelt attempt, if we want to be charitable at least, a heartfelt attempt to, to reestablish or at least to preserve intimacy with God. Now, the problem with this, though, and let's think about this in a kind of theological vein, generally. Um, if this image is supposed to represent God to the Israelite people in such a way as to make him, God, intimately present to them, how do we know that it does that? The golden calf is simply an image or a representation. How do we know that it accurately represents God? If we don't know that, then we, the Israelites really have no assurance that this I, idol is directly representing divinity to them and so making it available or intimate to them. If we can ascertain, if they can ascertain that the idol accurately portrays or represents God, then they already have intimacy with God. They don't need an idol. They can say, well, we know how God is, and so we don't need to see whether the idol corresponds to him or not. We just know we have this intimate relationship with him, so there's no need for any golden calf or any other kind of idol or representation of divinity. Now, what's interesting about this is that later, after Moses comes back and chastises the people, he, there's a very a remarkable scene that unfolds in Exodus. And this takes place in Exodus uh, chapter 33, verse 11, where Moses actually goes into a tent on the outskirts of the Israelite camp and actually shares, has an intimate encounter with God there. He, he is with God. The scripture actually says in Exodus 33, chapter, uh, verse 11, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as one man speaks to another. And in German, this actually comes through clear. I'm using the Einheitsübersetzung, which is a standard biblical text used by Catholics and Protestants in Germany today. The German run reads as follows, Der Herr und Moses redeten miteinander Auge in Auge wie Menschen miteinander reden. God and Moses spoke with one another eye to eye as human beings speak with one another. It's a wonderful passage. And so Moses has this intimacy with God in the what's called the Revelation Tent or the Offenbarungszelt in German, this tent that's pitched on the outside of camp where Moses dwells in intimacy with divinity or has this intimate encounter with God where they can speak to one another face to face. It's a remarkable, a remarkable passage. Now, what's interesting here is what is to ask, well, what would a Galassianite theology say about this scriptural episode? The Galassianite theologian would say, well, look, what we have here is in the first part of the story where the Israelites try to preserve or recover or gain intimacy with God by erecting or building or having built a certain idol, the golden calf, they fall into a certain kind of metaphysical confusion where they think they have a representation of divinity itself that will make divinity intimate to them. Problem being that they have no way of knowing whether the representation is accurate unless they already have access, intimate access to divinity, in which case they don't need any idol. They already have this intimacy. So there's a kind of philosophical or metaphysical conundrum here. Moses then destroys the golden calf. And we can see this as a sort of an activity. His activity of destruction is sort of the destructuring of this metaphysical illusion or this metaphysical conundrum that has misled the Israelites and that Moses then, after that, it's only after that happens that first Moses in the Revelation tent or the Ofenbarungszelt, and subsequently the Israels again, 
have this kind of remarkable face-to-face -face intimacy with God that's not mediated by anything. Now, that, the Galassian-Height theologian will say, that pertains to the experience of divinity once the metaphysical confusion has been relayed. There's a kind of peaceful, serene, tranquilized dwelling of Moses in the Offenbarungszelt with God that then gradually extends to the rest of the Israelite people. So that's what a Galassian-Height uh, theologian would say about that. And notice, it's very interesting that Heidegger himself writes at one point in a way that's very similar to what we just said about Moses and God in the Revelation tent. Heidegger says, describing his life at his cabin, uh, the Hütte in Totnauberg, where he did a lot of his writing, this is my work world. Strictly speaking, I never observe the landscape. I experience its hourly changes, day and night, in the great comings and goings of the seasons, the gravity of the mountains and the hardness of their primeval, primeval rock the slow and deliberate growth of the fir trees, the brilliant simple splendor of the meadows in bloom, the rush of the mountain brook in the long autumn night, the stern simplicity of the flatlands covered with snow. All of this moves and flows through daily experience up here, not in moments of forced aesthetic immersion or artificial empathy, but only when one's existence stands in its work. It is the work alone that opens up space for the reality that is these mountains. Notice that Heidegger isn't looking at postcards of his environs or representations. He is directly engaged with that, intimately engaged with it, you might say, through his work, his work world. And the same thing is going on with Moses vis-a-vis -vis God in the Offenbarungszelt, um, the Revelation tent. So it's a remarkable correspondence there, or parallel. Now, what about the Streit theologian? How would the Streit theologian look at this episode of the golden calf and Moses' meeting with God in the Revelation tent? And what comes immediately after that? Well, in order to understand that, we need to go a little bit further with the story. While Moses is in the Offenbarungszelt with God, he asks God, and this occurs in Exodus, Exodus 33, verses 19 through 20, he asks God to let him, Moses, see God's glory. And God responds in the verses that I just mentioned, I, God, will make all my beauty pass before you, and in your presence I will pronounce my name, Lord. I, will, I who show favors to whom I will, I who grant mercy to whom I will, but my face you cannot see, for no man sees me and still lives. Now think about that for a minute. We just heard that Moses, in the Offenbarungszelt, enjoyed face-to-face -face intimacy with God as one human being speaks to another. Now, Moses paradoxically asks God, well, I want to see your face. I want to see your glory, which God understands. Well, you want to see me face-to-face. -face. And God says, well, you can't, you can't do that. No man can see me. No human being can see me and live. Now, here it sounds like we have a contradiction. On the one hand, Moses sees God face to face. On the other hand, he, wa he doesn't and he wants that. He both does and does not see God face to face. We have a tension or a paradox or even perhaps a contradiction, some might say, here that emerges out of this story. And the strike theologian is going to jump on that. She's going to say, well, look, the, the business where Moses castigates the people, tears down the golden calf, gets rid of this idol, this, this representation that purports to make God intimately available to the Israelites, that has to do with Galassenheit. The Galassenheit in the Offenbarung cell, for example, that's the aftermath of this castigation by Moses of the Israelite people. That's the aftermath of that. And so that's the culmination of the process of deconstruction, of removing the obstacles to having an, in, an intimate relationship with divinity. This conceptual confusion or this mistake that, that happens on the part of the Israelite people. But then we come to the real experience or encounter with God, and that is when Moses paradoxically, and by extension the Israelite people, paradoxically or even contradictorily, both can see God to fa face to face and yet want to see God face to face. What does that possibly mean? It, it sounds, it's an enigma. It's, it's something that's very concealed, and so the strike theologian thinks that that 
is precisely what the fundamental human experience of divinity is, is the experience with that kind of riddle, with that kind of enigma, right? So here we have these two very different theological options. Now, just to say a little bit more about that before finishing for today, the Galassenheit theologian would not want to say that our fundamental experience of God is, a, is that of a contradiction or a paradox. And she might interpret Moses' request to see God face to face in light of what God says later. He says that he's going to, let's see if I can find exactly where that is. Yeah, God goes on to say in Exodus 33, 21 through 23, he takes God up into a hollow in the mountain and says, Here, continued the Lord, is a place near me where you shall station yourself on the rock. When my glory passes, I will set you in the hollow of the rock and will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand so that you may see my back, but my face is not to be seen. See my back. There's, a, there's an implication here that God is supposed to follow, be followed by Moses, that God is to, supposed to walk behind Moses is supposed to walk behind God and only see him from behind, right? Now, it's a very famous thing that, a very famous point that, um, what's his name? Uh, yeah, Gregory of Nyssa makes. He, he interprets it along these lines. And what we see here is, for the Galassenheit theologian, it's important for Moses not to set up some kind of new idol, in the form of the Offenbarung cell or the Revelation tent. That could become an idol just as much as the golden calf was. And so it's important in order to preserve intimacy with God not to, to get stuck in a particular place or with a particular image or with a particular set of activities because that runs the risk of reinstating the idolatry. And so that's what the Galassenheit theologian might go on to say there. The point here, though, is that we see that this key scriptural episode can be interpreted very differently by both the Galassenheit theologian and the Strite theologian, and that shows us that these theologies do have some purchase, or they can be rooted or applied to, the exegesis of sacred scripture. Now that's enough for today. What I want to do next time is show how the same point could be made in connection with a key, a key scriptural episode in the New Testament. There we'll see the same kind of dialectic. But until then, let's reflect about that a little bit more, and next time we'll continue. And remember that our ultimate goal here is, after having done this, what we want to do, at least our interim goal, is to set the stage for a kind of provisional evaluation of these two possible theologies, Galassenheit theology and Strite theology. So thank you for joining me today. I hope that these uh, remarks have been helpful, and I look forward to speaking with you next time. Thank you.